Hi, I'm Dr. Lindquist, and I'm joined today by Dr. Muchatuta. Hello. Today, we are going to be speaking about clinically assessing the dysmic patient. At the end of the lecture, you should be able to perform a rapid assessment for the dysmic patient, determine the severity of dysmia, and identify high-risk features, particularly in patients suspected of having COVID-19. Let's start with a case. This is a 65-year-old male with shortness of breath. He complains of cough and fever for several days. His granddaughter has had similar symptoms, but is improving. Neither of them have been tested for COVID-19. As you look at this patient, begin to think about how you would manage this patient in your clinic, hospital, or ambulance. What approach might you take? During this lecture, we will focus on developing a general approach to every dysmic patient. Before you even begin, you must ensure your scene is safe and you are protecting yourself with the appropriate personal protective equipment. Dr. Muchatuta, can you explain your next steps in the general approach at this point? Yes. Next, I would assess the general appearance and the mental status of the patients, followed by the airway by assessing for the ability to speak. Next, I assess breathing and finally circulation. These are the ABCs. Thank you. That's great. You must remember to evaluate, think, and act simultaneously with dealing with emergency patients. We are focusing on breathing during this lecture. There are many ways to assess breathing in our patient. This begins before you even touch the patient or listen to his or her lungs. Let's look again at the patient in our case. Dr. Muchatuta, does this patient look comfortable or distressed? This patient looks distressed. Can you explain how you are able to determine that he looks distressed? Of course. There are many clues here. You notice the patient is using accessory muscles to breathe. Normally, breathing involves an active inhalation with comfortable chest expansion and passive exhalation due to chest recoil. When something is affecting the patient's ability to breathe normally, patients often try to compensate for that by using other structures like the intercostal muscles or abdominal muscles. They may also sit upright with their hands on their knees, which is called tripod positioning or tripoding. The general appearance and initial assessment begin to help the provider determine the severity of the patient's symptoms. You can classify severe symptoms as respiratory distress or respiratory failure. Determining the severity of symptoms helps you decide which actions to take to care for the patient, even before you have completed the evaluation. Patients in respiratory distress may have impending respiratory failure. Signs of respiratory failure may include cyanosis or blue discoloration of the skin or unconsciousness. Patients developing respiratory failure most commonly have problems with oxygenation or ventilation or a combination of both. These patients are sick. There is a spectrum of respiratory distress. As you remember, the body depends on oxygenation and ventilation to breathe. Oxygen exchange occurs in the lungs, and if there is damage to the lung tissue as seen in infection, oxygenation may be affected. Ventilation is the process of air moving in and out of the lungs. Problems with ventilation can lead to alterations in carbon dioxide. You must recognize the symptoms of respiratory distress and start treatment immediately to prevent further decrease in oxygen that leads to hypoxemic respiratory failure or increase in carbon dioxide, which leads to hypercapnic respiratory failure. Dr. Muchatuta, can you remind us what some of the signs or symptoms of respiratory distress are? Yes, gladly. These signs include slow or rapid breathing, altered mentation, diaphoresis or sweating, inability to lie flat, brief speech, or use of accessory muscles as we discussed previously. High risk features require immediate intervention. Once we've completed our general impression and ABCs and intervened on any abnormalities, we are now able to focus a bit on the history. There are many ways to take a careful history and history is incredibly important. 
However, we won't spend too much time on it here. For sick patients, history should not delay treatment and important diagnostics. Dr. Muchatuta, based on your extensive experience with COVID-19, is a complaint of shortness of breath concerning in patients with potential COVID-19? Yes, it is concerning. Studies suggest that shortness of breath can predict more serious lung injury in patients diagnosed with COVID-19. The past medical history should be obtained for all patients. Past medical history of heart disease, lung disease, and diabetes has been associated with more severe cases of COVID-19. Let's now talk about vital signs. Of course, all vital signs are important. In assessing patients with dyspnea, you should pay careful attention to the oxygen saturation and respiratory rate. Every patient should have a pulse oximeter placed immediately, like shown in this image. If feasible in your healthcare setting, continuous pulse oximeter should be used during the entire evaluation and considered in all admitted patients. You must observe for lowering of oxygen saturation as seen in this image and intervene as necessary. Remember, your goal oxygen saturation should be around 94%. Dr. Muchatuta, I'd like you to tell us a little more about the concept of silent hypoxia. Sure, some patients with COVID-19 have no symptoms or mild symptoms. Further, some patients with quite profound hypoxia may not have the symptoms or signs that you would suspect for low oxygen. Therefore, it is very important that a pulse oximeter is used early in the evaluation to identify these high-risk patients and initiate oxygen therapy early. After we've completed our initial assessments and begin to determine severity of dyspnea, checked vital signs, paying careful attention to pulse oximetry, we are now able to examine the patient more thoroughly. Let's focus on just a few things here. Let's first talk about sounds you may hear in patients with shortness of breath. Strider is a high-pitched inspiratory sound that signifies problems with the upper airway. This is often caused by airway obstruction from things like angioedema or anaphylaxis. Next, wheezing is a high-pitched sound that can be inspiratory and expiratory. It is often expiratory, but can also be continuous. It signifies problems lower in the lungs from inflammation or obstruction. Wheezing can be heard in patients with conditions like asthma or emphysema, but can also be heard in patients with infections like those with COVID-19. Dr. Muchatuta, can you describe crackles for us? Crackles signify the presence of fluid in the lungs as the alveoli attempt to open. It sounds like a popping. This is from infections like pneumonia or from pulmonary edema. Finally, ronchi is commonly heard in patients with pulmonary infections. These are often continuous, low-pitched sounds. The sound you are listening to is from a patient with ronchi and distant sounds as they struggle with acute respiratory distress syndrome from COVID-19. Remember that dyspnea can be caused by a number of things. Most commonly, these are related to the heart and lungs, but not always. Therefore, it's important to evaluate the whole patient. This includes a neurologic exam, an evaluation for trauma, listening to the heart for extra sounds, performing an abdominal exam, assessing for things like edema in the legs, and looking for signs of toxicity. For COVID-19 patients, they may develop signs of heart failure with lower extremity edema, signs of deep vein thrombus with asymmetric lower extremity swelling, signs of acute limb ischemia with absent pulse, or develop rashes among many, many other conditions. Dr. Muchatuta, after the initial evaluation of dysmic patients, how do you continue to care for them? Patients with dyspnea should be reassessed often during the evaluation. If available, patients should have a continuous pulse oximeter and critical patients should also have cardiac monitoring. In my experience with COVID-19 patients, you must always monitor for unprovoked decompensation. 
Throughout the entire process of evaluating your patients, it is important to start mentally creating a differential diagnosis. There are many potential causes of dyspnea. We can break them down into a few different categories seen here. Remember that during a pandemic such as now, all dyspneic patients should be assumed to have COVID-19 until proven otherwise. We've covered a lot of material on how to approach the dysmic patient. Let's talk about a few key pearls. Remember that a systematic approach is required to ensure that you do not miss anything. During a pandemic, every dysmic patient should be treated as if they have COVID-19. Therefore, every patient should be evaluated with appropriate personal protective equipment. You must identify the patients with respiratory distress and failure and initiate therapy immediately. Finally, remember to use the pulse oximeter for every patient with dyspnea. Thank you. Thank you.